scripture this morning comes from the book of Acts, chapter 9, verses 1 through 19. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul replied. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he said. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. In, this, in Damascus, he, there he dis, was, was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man named Tarsus, from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias replied, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and was baptized, and after taking some, time, some food, he regained his strength. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Good morning, church. Howdy. That's an Aggie thing, you know. I got away with that. Now, I live, I, I am an Aggie in exile. In Northwest Texas, I live in Lubbock. We live in Lubbock, and uh, I've served uh, smaller churches, uh, Anson, that's around Abilene, and Shallow Water, and Idaho, and um, and and now I'm uh, appointed to school. Don't know what I'm going to do, but I'm appointed to school. And uh, I got away with saying howdy for uh, like four years, five years, until uh, someone's uh, daughter went up to their dad and said, "You know, Brooks is doing that Aggie thing." And, and Ken said, oh, no, he's not. He's just greeting us. So, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, he is. So the next, the next week, and I didn't know this, I said, howdy. And I was like, howdy, howdy. He sabotaged. But anyway, it's good to be here today. It's a joy. It's, a, it's, it's an honor. I want to I wanna thank you for the opportunity. Um, this is my church. Uh, this is the only church that I've ever been a member. Uh, it's the only church I'll ever be a member. You, you are my people. And uh, more importantly, you're God's people. Uh, I want to thank you for that. I want to thank you for, uh, for being here and being a constant witness for the kingdom of God. Uh, my dad always asks, are you going to wear your dress today? I say, it's a cassock, Dad. It's a cassock, but I'm wearing uh, my, my dress today, and uh, maybe he's watching on Facebook Live with millions of others. And Mark Zuckerberg, who probably needs this more than the rest of us. I don't know. Probably. Today I want to ask you a question. Who's the hero of this story. Who is the hero of this story? In Acts 9, 1 through 19, have we overlooked a major contributor 
to the kingdom of God, to God's mission on earth. Have we been taught by our culture? Have we been trained in school? Have we just accepted, you know, what's more common to overlook a real hero in God's story? So I'm going to ask you, who's the, who's the hero? Now, I'm used to people like kids answering and things like that. Who's the hero? Who would you say? Who's the hero? Yeah. Well, you don't supposed to say that. Yeah. Some people might say God, right? The Holy Spirit. It's the Sunday school answer. Jesus. Well, that you would be correct. That, that is the true hero, right? What we find in this story is the, the Holy Spirit guiding people. And, and Jesus speaking to Saul, Jesus uh, leading a disciple and coordinating and bringing them together. What we find is that behind the scenes, God is moving. God is moving in his people. The Holy Spirit is guiding and leading. So if you said the Spirit, or Jesus, or God the Father, you'd be right. Because we are joined in a co-mission in and under the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen? We are in a co-mission with the eternal Trinity for the redemption of not only humanity, but all of the world. Have you heard that before? Amen. That's your purpose. That's our mission. That's your co-mission. But I'm going to ask you again, who's the real hero? You might answer Saul. Well, Saul is a great choice. He's, he's big time, right? He wrote right two-thirds of the New Testament. He, got, he, he changed his name, right, from Saul to Paul. He is the apostle to the Gentiles. Jesus says in this text, he's my instrument, right? To take my name, to take the gospel, to share the kingdom of heaven with the Gentiles, right? And what we find in the book of Acts, it's, it goes from a small local church in the place that's real familiar, right? In Judea, Samaria, Jerusalem. And then it goes into every direction, not just Europe, but down to Africa, out uh, east towards India down in every direction. And Paul is highlighting that step. If you said, Paul, you're, you're great, or Saul, he is, uh, he's quite possibly the, 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 the best educated early Christian, right? He, he sat under the greatest professor in his day. He knew the law. As to the law, I am, what would he say? Blameless, Right? I mean, this is a guy, this is a stud Christian. Paul's a great answer. He did a lot of great things. But I want to ask you again, who's the hero of the text? You see, I've come to read this differently over years of ministry. And it's not so much that I read this every day, right? You know, I'm always in the Word or something like that. It's because I have experience. And it's, it has shaped my, my reading. It's informed me, right? And now I see things in a new way. Today I want to share with you who I think is the hero. I want to take us in a different direction. I just want to share about a certain disciple in Damascus named Ananias. That's it. That's about all he gets. He made it in the book, right? <laughs> he made the cut. But that's about all we know about Ananias. There was a particular or a certain disciple in Damascus named Ananias. But what an impact he had on the early church. Our culture, right, it's the, it's the, you know, the, the, the culture, when you talk about culture, it's the water a fish swims in, right? 
It's, 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 it's our society, our culture, the values, the norms. It's our location, the people. It, we have a culture and a society that, that uh, pushes us toward hero worship. Uh, but really that's celebrity worship. Uh, we, we, uh, we talk in terms of like going viral, right? Not too long ago, if you ask somebody in America, you want to go viral, they're like, no way, I don't want to die. You know, I don't want to catch a virus. You know, and then we talked about a virus in your computer, and, you know, still that's like, what is a virus in a computer, right? But now we talk in terms of going viral. Why? So people can watch our video, and I hope millions do watch on Facebook Live right now. Right, and when we want to talk about it being a big impact, and it is, it's great. Social media, we have so many things that can, uh, that can be used for the gospel of the kingdom. But we have a culture that pushes the celebrity, puts them out forward, because we need Hollywood, right? A publisher one time said, Brooks, I love your book, or whatever, you know. Why don't you, uh, but we can't publish it. Why don't you just start a discipleship movement? Okay, I'll do that tomorrow. Why don't you just start, you know, have a blog, get a blog or, a, you know, a website. And just, why don't you start a discipleship movement? And I'm thinking, like, Wesley, you know? We have a culture in our church. We, we want to look, I mean, we've been trained, and ministry is tough. You've got you, you to gotta take care of your pastor, amen, and his wife and kids, right? And you all do, and you all always have. And I appreciate that, because I have experience. But in, in ministry, we look out, and I don't want to speak for David, but uh, and I, and it's true, we think, oh, wow, man, if that person could come and we could, you know, join our church, or if, if, that, person, uh, if that person could become a Christian and leave that life, lifestyle, what a, what a witness they could be, right? Because they already have the fame, everybody knows who they are. If, if, if they could just, someone could just get a hold of them and, and they could get converted, you know, they could be like the rock star Tim Tebow version, right? What an amazing thing, and there's certainly examples. Because ministry is tough. This church thing is tough. And, and there's always a, a lure, a, a temptation. Like if we could just find someone who, who has so much influence and they could help our church grow or, or they could do this or blah, blah, blah. I mean, I don't know if I was taught that. It's just like running a business or, or, or you know, it's just, it's just what you do. You want to grow. You want things that can help. But this text points us in a different direction. You see, we often look for a saw, a coach, a gifted speaker, whatever. We look for saws because saws may become Paul's. But we sometimes overlook and take for granted a certain disciple named Ananias. I want to share with you real quickly three things and why I think Ananias is really my hero, my hero in the church. Ananias heard God. He heard God. He, it, 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 the text says he, it, God spoke to him in a vision, all right? Um, I don't really know what that is. is it, was it like a vision in a dream? Did he wake up? Was he sitting at his desk, you know, drinking coffee, reading the paper? He has a vision. Boom! Whoa! I, I don't really know, right? But it, it, the, the, the voice of God, Jesus, Jesus himself, this is the resurrected, glorified Son of God, incarnate Lord from heaven, speaking to Ananias, just spoke to Paul, or Saul, right? Speaking to Ananias in a vision, and he heard him. Now, I don't want to overlook that, 
because sometimes it's hard, right? We, we, you may have struggled with, uh, have I heard the Lord? Have I heard God's voice? Is this really God leading me? And we even see in this text, you know, there's this little bit of back and forth with Ananias. In, in Jesus, Jesus says, go, lay your hands on Saul. He's, you know, you're going to give him side, et cetera, et cetera. And Ananias says, Lord, do you know his reputation? That's dangerous. Are you sure, right? And then Jesus kind of says, go, right? After that, go, you know, he's going to be my instrument. So we, we, we find this concern with Ananias, and, and that needs to be looked at seriously. You need to pause right there. But what we don't find is Ananias saying something like, Gideon, uh, I have this vision. Now I'll just put a carpet out. And, and Lord, if, if this half is wet, you know, in the morning, then it's the Lord. That happens. And then the next day, well, I'll just put this carpet or whatever, sheepskin you know, carpet. And if the other side is, you know, whatever, dry or wet, you know, that's the Lord, right? Okay, if, if, if somebody calls me in the next one minute and, and, and confirms this, that's the Lord telling me to do this. That's not what we find in Ananias. It's a lot more like Moses. Moses, right? Remember Moses? The important guy? Hero. Moses, right? Questionable background. Yeah. He sees this bush that's on fire and it, it's not consumed. It's the Lord. He knows it. It's Yahweh. He knows it. He doesn't say, I'm going to come back and walk around and if it's still burning, <laughs> it's Yahweh. Now, what we also find in Moses' story is when, uh, when, when, when Yahweh says, Go to Egypt. Tell him to let my people go. He says, oh, I can't speak. I, don't, I can't do that. Lord says, go, go, go. I'm sending you. Oh, I don't know. And finally, there's this interchange where Yahweh says, fine. Uh, just go. I'll send your brother Aaron, and he'll speak for me. But we don't find Moses not knowing the voice of God. Same thing with Samuel. Speaks to him at night. Here I am. It is me, right? But we don't find them putting the Lord to the test. Ananias may struggle with some of the possible outcomes of his decision. But when the Lord speaks to him, he knows. He knows it. It's undeniable. He knows it. If the Lord speaks to me and says, go to Syria... I'm going to have to obey. But I can certainly say, well, I mean, what's going to happen to my family? How are you going to take care of me? Are you sending me to a war zone? I need some confirmation on the details of that. But if the Lord tells me to go, the Lord tells you to go. And you heard him. And it's undeniable. Second thing is that Ananias went. I know, this is like Captain Obvious, right? A Ananias went, but we shouldn't overlook that, right? Because we don't know, we don't really know what's going to happen with the rest of the story until we go, until you obey. You're not going to get, you know, the rest of the story until you're out there. You're probably going to learn it as you go or after you go. And, and who knows how long it's going to take to minister to this guy named Saul, who's, you know, you've heard some bad things about, right? He's put people in jail. He's, he's broken up families. He has, you know, watched one of the real heroes of the faith get stoned to death, right? And, you know, like, he's all good. We don't really know what's going to happen with the consequences, the, the, but the point is that we hear when we go. And we've got to discern and make things out. Uh, I'm going to embarrass my old friend. I asked Susan, I said, Susan, come to church. I was 14. Kingdom-minded, right? It took 27 years. But your family's here and your whole family is here, right? It's just like I planned. 27 years later, right? What a joy. Serving. Part of our community. 
right? Part of our community of faith and part of this community. It's awesome. It's incredible. I feel like that commercial sometimes when, uh, you know, I'm becoming like my parents. You know that commercial? They sit around, you know, and they all talk about how they say things like, ooh, it's so chilly in here, or, you know, defense wins championship, right? You know, that, that commercial, I don't know, what is it, a Geico commercial, I think? Yeah, I think it's a Geico commercial. But I look back, and I kind of have those kind of moments, and I think, man, I, I'm just so proud of so many people. I'm proud that uh, Susan and her family are here. I'm proud that she teaches uh, English, right? No. Teach math. Okay, teach math. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm proud of that. We used to sit in English with Jeremy and Robert, and uh, every time Tabitha Hippler came around and said, Are you all working? Oh, yes, oh, yes, oh, yes. And then she leaves 20 minutes later, Are you all working? And she knew. I'm so proud. I see people like uh, Nancy Dixon, Nancy Johnson, you know, grew up in this community now coaching, her and her uh, husband serving. Uh, I just looked backwards. I saw David. Hey, David. I'm not used to people being behind me. David's been serving, serving this church before I even knew how. I even knew what service was. We don't really know how things are going to work out. That's not really how God operates. I mean, sometimes you might get a glimpse. Sometimes, but you really don't know how long you'll stay somewhere. You really don't know what's going to happen to you. You just hear and you go. Ananias was content to allow Saul to be God's instrument and he be the Lord Jesus' agent of transformation. You see, unless Ananias hears and leaves, hears and goes, unless he obeys, there is, there is a critical moment in the movement of the kingdom of God in the early church that's going to stop. Get delayed at best. The Holy Spirit in the book of Acts is behind the scenes moving and moving and winning and converting. Calling certain disciples to be part of God's mission. Not to be the instrument, but be the agent behind the scenes. The agent of transformation. Saul will be Paul. He changes his name. You know, it's not like in the Old Testament way they change a name. Saul changes his name to Paul because he's probably witnessing to Romans and Greeks and things like that. But what the church needs is an Ananias to meet with him, to lay hands on him, to guide him, to be a place where he can stay and learn and then go out and accomplish a far greater impact for the kingdom. And Ananias is my hero because he heard, because he went, and finally, because he taught. Remember what Jesus says in the in, in, in you know in that conversation. You know, who is this? Are you sure? Yes, he's going to be my instrument, okay? Go, and this is what he says: go to the house of Judas on Straight Street <clears throat> and ask for the man from Tarsus named Saul. For he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias. And come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Now, that's the first conversation. Are you sure? It kind of has one of those different strokes moments. What you're talking about, Mr. Drummond, right? What you're talking about, Jesus, right? And then we get the second part, right? Go, this man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings and before the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for me. But when we come back to Ananias' interaction, what does, what, what's different? What does he say? Ananias went to the house, entered it, placing his hands on Saul. He said, Brother Saul, 
the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Maybe, you know, now, now Luke is a historian. Luke, Luke, Luke gathered. He had lots of sources. <coughs> Excuse me. But what we find in here is this little phrase, this preposition, anywhere a mouse can meander, Mom. This preposition, so that you may be filled with the Holy Spirit. I'm just wondering if this is a glimpse into Ananias' education, his discipleship. You see, if I'm allowed to, I'm going to take the liberty to maybe connect these. Ananias is already on mission with God. He is in Damascus. There is a community of faith. Here comes Saul. He goes to this other house, part of the community. The Lord says, he's going to be my instrument to do this, 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 and this. Ananias says, hey, brother, that's insignificant, by the way. I came, I'm going to lay my hands on you, you're going to get your sight, and you're going to be filled with the Holy Spirit. He made a connection, folks, with the greater theme and purpose of this book. Ananias, if I have the liberty to do so, makes a connection with God's mission and the necessity, the utter helplessness of the power of the Holy Spirit in your life and the desperate need for the Holy Spirit in your life. If you don't have the Spirit, it's going to be difficult to be God's instrument. He makes a connection. He theologizes. He knows what's involved with mission, with ministry, with being a church. You need your sight spiritually. You got to see the truth, the gospel, and you can't walk, you know. Obviously, God doesn't want you to be blind, but you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Ananias went, Ananias heard, because Ananias heard, and Ananias taught and offered the filling of the Holy Spirit. As our musicians come forward, we're going to sing a song, and I want you to think about who the real hero of this text is. I want you to consider this story of Ananias. I want you to, th how can I be an Ananias? Is God calling me? Has he spoke to me? Have I heard him? Or have I heard him and I'm just not ready to go? Maybe you're ready to go and, and, you know, and that might not be in Africa. That might be here. It probably is here in this community to serve in some way. But you're thinking, now, what kind of impact is that going to have on my life? And I've got to get these things. That's okay. You can ponder those. You can work those out. The Lord will help you with that. But if he's heard you, you're going to have to go. As the Lord taught you to teach this ministry, this gospel. So today, I want you to stand. Not yet. I want you to stand. If you understand what a hero in the faith is. I want you to stand right now if you get the Ananias story. If you understand that, yeah, there's going to be Saul's who become Paul's who do great things. There's going to be people like that, and we need them. Look at Billy Graham. Look at Ravi Zacharias, one of my, one of my favorites. Look, oh, no, stand, stay standing, brother. Stay standing. If you get it, if you get who Ananias is, I'm going on out on a limb here, David. Get it.
Do you understand who Ananias is? There's going to be, we need people like that. We need people like William Lane Craig. We need people like Billy Graham. And what an influence is, yeah. But you know, without an Ananias in a local church who's willing to be forgotten in the pages of history, but remember that he was used by God to help someone, yeah, it's a far greater thing. It's the side down you. The first is last. The last is first. You want to be greatest in this kingdom, you better be a servant of Jesus Christ. You better not be battling like, oh, let me put me here, let me go here. Yeah, guess what? That's a dead end. If you want to be greatest, church, do you want to be great? Do you want to be a hero? Who wants to be a hero? Rightly defined as Ananias, do you? You want to be a hero? The only reason here is the grace of God, that God took a sinner, a sinner, and transformed me, and still transforming me. That God had people in this church, in this church, my second grade Sunday school teacher right there, Mrs. Martin, and my uh, middle school teacher. She did two services that I can never pay back. There's so many people in this church. Every time I come back, this church is larger. That doesn't happen by coincidence. It's also like 40 years of good leadership. And that's important. That's critical. But every time I come, there's more people that I've never seen. In, in, in 14 years of ministry, right? And, and I, will pro- I may never pastor another church because I'm going in a different direction now. I'm looking towards teaching. I might be an associate. I don't know. Who knows? I might work in the oil field if I have to. But looking back over, I wish I'd have prayed for more Ananiases. Because it's the Ananiases that make it happen, that accomplish the kingdom of God. And it's your joy to be forgotten in your service, but to be completely poured out. Amen? Amen. Ananias. Amen.